Welcome to the Concepts of Faith broadcast. This program is dedicated to teaching you how to put the Word of God to work so that it will make a positive difference in the everyday circumstances of your life. Thank you for joining us for the Concepts of Faith broadcast. I'm Charles Capps, and we're going to be talking about on this broadcast the prophetic profile revealed through the Solomon concept. You know, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and the thing that is done is that which shall be done. There's no new thing under the sun. In other words, already happened in old time which was before us. There's a revelation here, and, and I want to bring it out concerning the rapture of the church, the catching away of the saints. Now, don't let that word rapture offend you. Some folks says it's not in the Bible, but it is in the original Hebrew in a skip sequence uh, in a uh, layered revelation in there confirming the word. It's even in the Old Testament. Uh, it's, it's all through the scriptures, the catching away. We see it in different ways. Uh, it comes from a Greek word, rapi, and uh, catching away. It really means rapture, catching away. So don't get bent out of shape over the word rapture. Let's just follow the timeline and how God reveals it through the Solomon concept. Now, let's go over to Exodus. And uh, we find in Exodus, the 10th chapter, something that is very interesting. Uh, you remember the keys, one of the keys of understanding end time events and being able to assimilate God's timeline is a day is with the Lord as the thousand years, thousand years a day in certain instances. So here in the 19th chapter of Exodus, let's begin reading with uh, verse uh, 10. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Now, how many days is that? Today and tomorrow? That's two days, isn't it? So this is a, a cue that possibly this has something to do with the 2,000 years, 2,000 years of the church age, two days of the church age. Day is with the Lord, 1,000 years, 1,000 years is a day. Let them wash their clothes, get cleaned up. Why? Be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord's coming down in the sight of all the people on Mount Sinai. Now catch this. Two days, get ready. The third day the Lord's coming down on top of the mountain. Now let's, let's, let's look at this verse. Be ready against the third day. What was it Hosea said? Talking to Israel, said, The Lord has torn, He will heal us. After two days, He will revive us. In other words, after the church age, God's going to deal with the Jews again. And the third day, He shall raise us up, and we'll live in His sight. <laughs> well, here we go, right here. The Old Testament, 3,000 or so years ago here, we're having an event take place that reveals the rapture of the church or the catching away of the church, how you want to say it, be ready against the third day. The Lord's come down on sight of all people in Mount Sinai. Now, this was God's people. He was coming down inside of. Now, in this verse, here's an important thing that I wanted to mention right here. We'll talk about it later. But we found out that every 50th year is a jubilee in, in Israel, and uh, on the other broadcast, we talked about man's days are numbered, are determined, and his number of months are with God, and, and he cannot exceed those bounds. In other words, talking about the days of dominion of the Genesis account. He said, let them have dominion. For how long? For evidently 6,000 years. So here we find that in this verse, 11 of uh, Exodus, is the word, the Jubilee, in a ELS equidistance letter sequencing, it's like rungs on a ladder. You skip ever so many uh, letters in the Hebrew, and it spells the Jubilee. So this is a clue that this is a Jubilee, and not only a Jubilee, this is the Jubilee. 
<laughs> so keep that in mind as we go through this. Now come down to verse uh, 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunder and lightning and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a voice of a trumpet exceedingly loud. Now does this sound somewhat familiar to you? To 1 Thessalonians 4 where the Apostle Paul said, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. Michael the archangel shout with the trump of God blended with the trump of God sounded like a voice of a trumpet talking. And here is the, the voice of a trumpet exceedingly loud so that all the people that were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. Now you remember Moses, Moses lived 120 years. Now see, we've been talking about the days of man's dominion. There's 120 jubilees every 50 year of the jubilee. And 120 jubilees is 6,000 years. There's another interesting event that happened in the New Testament on the day of Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost means 50. That's all it means, just 50. And on the day of Pentecost, how many were in the upper room? 120. Now, isn't that interesting? Now, if you multiply those numbers together, what do you get? 6,000. So it seems that God has layered the word with these revelations and numbers, a way they're associated with certain events, to give us insight into the fact that it's confirmation of the written word of God. You don't uh, generate doctrine by numbers. You just simply, the numbers and the way they're associated with events uh, help you with the revelation and the confirmation of it. So here's Moses. He lived 120 years. If you remember, he died and God buried him in the valley of Moab. Now, Moses evidently he is, seems to be a profile of the righteous dead of 120 jubilees who died before they entered into the promised land of heaven. And uh, it fits in that profile. So here, Notice, the third day in the morning, the Lord came, will come down on the mountain. And that's exactly what happened here. The third day in the morning, thunder and lightning, thick clouds, sounds a whole lot like 1 Thessalonians 4, and said, The Lord himself sent him heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Now the dead in Christ shall rise first. Moses' life seems to be a prophetic profile of all the righteous dead of 120 jubilees who died before they entered into heaven. Now, the, you know, you heard probably most of your life up to now that, well, you're not going to get out of this world alive anyway. Oh, yeah. There is a righteous generation and the last generation that will not die but will be caught up alive. And I believe that is this generation. Uh, you can believe what you want to, but I believe it's this generation. But now here, if Moses represents the righteous dead of 120 jubilees, and you, you would say he represents all of the righteous dead, because after the rapture, the righteous, that part of it will never die anymore. They'll have immortal bodies. So you realize we're talking about the righteous dead of 120 jubilees when Moses represents. So he led the people up to meet with God. Now notice how the Holy Spirit uh, had them to write this. Now we know he didn't lead them up on the mountain, but the way it's worded gives you insight into what God is trying to get over to us. The dead in Christ, which Moses represents, led the people to meet with God. Now, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians uh, 6, uh, 4, 16, 17, I believe it is. The dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Now, another interesting thing. This, when he comes down on Mount Sinai, you realize he doesn't come down to the 
what we would call the earth, he, he comes mountaintop high on top of that mountain. Now, in 1 Thessalonians 4, I believe it's 17, where it says, caught up to meet the Lord in the air, the Greek word used there for air is a Greek word that means from ground level to the top of a mountain. Now, you can't get any more accurate than a prophetic profile of the rapture of the church in this verse right here in the Exodus 19. Now, this is, you know, <laughs> and now stop and think about it. This was the first Pentecost, 50 days after they came out of Egypt. This is what is called the first Pentecost. That's when this happened. Well, how many was there at Pentecost in the New Testament? There was a 120 in the upper room, and it was 50 days after. Here you have the man that lived 120 years, uh, representing the righteous dead, leading the people up to meet with God who came mountaintop high. I mean, well, he didn't, they didn't go up on the mountain. He wouldn't allow them up on the mountain. There's some things there we'll not get into. But this is a, a prophetic timeline profile by the Solomon concept revealing that things that happened in days past on the first Pentecost reveals the rapture in a very unique way. Now, we can call it catching away if you want, whatever you want to call it, but it's, we're going to be out of here when it happens. Now, let, let's notice here then in verse 16. Again, it came to pass the third day in the morning. Well, now, Brother Caps, how do you, are you sure that this has anything to do with the rapture? Well, there's a clue right here, and you need to know what it is. If you start with verse 16 in the fourth letter and skip every other letter from the fourth word and skip every other letter from left to right, it spells the Hebrew word bet shell hoof. Well, I, th I think I may have got, got this mixed up with another one. Let's race that off the, <laughs> to the tape. Let's go on with it. I'll clarify it in just a minute. Now, it says, it came to pass the third day in the morning. The third day in the morning. Isn't that interesting? According to what the, the Scripture tells us about uh, on the third day, He'll raise us up and we will live in His sight well, that is interesting, isn't it? Well, I was correct in the first place. It is in this scripture uh, that in the, you start with the fourth, it's found, the word rapture is found in the original Hebrew. And here, I don't know whether you can see that or not, but here's a printout of it in the Hebrew. And it says, the rapture found in the Torah code, the Hebrew phrase, in bet shall hoof. You start with the fourth letter, uh, and the first verse, I believe it is, and you skip every other letter. It's the Hebrew word, bet shall hoof, which means in the rapture. That's what it says. Now, this is embedded in an ELS skip sequence right here, and the skip sequence is two, every other letter, every second letter, and it says rapture. Now, is that a pretty good clue of what this is revealing? I don't know about you, but that, that, that pretty much uh, convinces me that this is actually the Solomon concept revealing the truth of what will happen in the rapture. Because you have a man that lived 120 years. Of course, he wasn't 120 years old here, but that's how long he lived. He led the people up to meet with God. And that's important to understand because uh, that coincides with what the Apostle Paul said. Now, there was a fellow called me and said, uh, Brother Caps, he said, I have a fellow staying with me. Uh, and he said, he's worked with the Bible computer code uh, for nine years. And uh, some of you have probably read the, the uh, Bible code, the book, the Bible code. Uh, now, you have to be careful with that because if you go 
two or three thousand or forty thousand skip sequence, you could have it say anything. But when you find it in ELS skip sequence in short distances in a chapter where it is seemingly referring to an event that could possibly be, and it spells it out in the original Hebrew in a uh, skip dick, uh, ELS skip sequence, then you have, you have some real messages that God's hidden in the Word of God. So I said, uh, check this chapter and see if you can find anything about uh, heaven and, and the church and, and what have you. So here's, here's, here's what he found in an ELS skip sequence. He says, uh, Michael, see, Michael, head of the rapture, uh, charge of the rapture of the church, Michael, he took church into heaven. Now, is that, is that a confirmation of what seems to be said here or, or what? This is embedded in the Hebrew. Michael, he took church into heaven. Now, this is 3,000 years ago, over 3,000 years ago. God has embedded this message in the original Hebrew so that when we read this, the generation that's going to be caught up reads this, we will know what it means. Other generations didn't have this. You remember Paul taught, he said, uh, uh, the Lord had given him a revelation of other generations didn't understand, but is now being revealed through the apostles and prophets. Well, this is what God's doing to this generation. Why? Because we are the generation that's going to be caught up. So, I don't know whether you believe it or not, but I believe it. It, it seems to be a real confirmation to me of, of what is being said here. It is absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, laying out the prophetic profile of events of the past, what I call through the Solomon concept, that reveals the rapture of the church. And it says it's the third day in the morning. Now that could be, that could be interesting too because of this. Because you see, uh, uh, the Hebrew day does not begin in the morning, it begins in the evening. So if, if that has play with this, then it would indicate that there would be a time period from the beginning of the third day till the morning, because the third day, uh, uh, Hebrew day, begins in the evening. So could that be a time slot for the end time harvest and the manifestation of God's power and anointing upon this earth? Seems to me like it could. It, it's at least worth looking into and, and thinking about. So uh, that's important to to see in the Scripture. Now let's go over to uh, the New Testament because there's some things in this New Testament that will help us understand it better. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, you'll notice in verse 27 says, uh, Jesus says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels, then shall He reward every man according to His works. Now, we re read from what the Apostle Paul wrote in Corinthians that we are rewarded for our works after we're raptured and we're in heaven. We'll be there seven years before we come back to the earth to rule and reign with Christ. Then in verse 28, he says, Verily I say unto you, there are some standing here which shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Now, isn't that an awesome statement? Some of you standing here won't taste death till you see this. Now, he wasn't talking about that the kingdom would come and Jesus would come in his kingdom. He said, you'll see it. It was a vision. Now, we, uh, chapter 17 says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother up to a high mountain apart was transfigured before them. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? He waited exactly six days. Now, remember that one of the keys to understanding the sequence and timing of the end time events is that a day is with the Lord's thousand years, thousand years is a day. So Jesus waited exactly six, six days after he made that statement. Then he took Peter, James, and John up to a high mountain. Now remember, 
It's a high mountain. So here we are. We're on this high mountain again. And uh, there's Jesus. And he's talking with Moses and Elijah. Now, isn't that something? Now, somebody said, well, that couldn't be a profile of the rapture because they only took three people with him, Peter, James, and John. Well, that's one of the clues. Peter, James, and John just happened to be, happened to be, <laughs> the ones he took with him when he went to raise the dead. Have you noticed that in the Scripture? They were called the sons of thunder, and, and they were with him when he raised the dead. So there's a resurrection. That reveals there's a resurrection of this event. And he was transfigured before them. His face did shine as sun, his raiment was white as light. Now, the only other place you find this is in the book of Revelation that this happens in the New Jerusalem. I believe, personally, they were caught up in the New Jerusalem, or the bodily or just in spirit form. I, I don't know. But uh, this vision, they were caught up in this vision, like John the Revelator was caught up into heaven. And they were in the New Jerusalem, evidently. Behold, there appeared Moses and Elias talking, or Elijah talking with them. And uh, now what are we going to say about this? Here's Moses and Elijah talking with them. Now Moses had been dead 1,500 years or 1,700 years at this time. And in the Old Testament, God said it's abomination to try to communicate with the dead. So Moses must be alive. He must be resurrected or he couldn't be talking with Jesus. Or Jesus wouldn't be talking with him because it'd be abomination to God. <laughs> now, isn't that an interesting thought? But then here's Elijah. Elijah represents the church. He was caught up alive and didn't die. Now, you remember Moses died, but he was 120 years old when he died. He represents the righteous dead of 120 jubilees who died before they entered into the promised land. So this is no doubt, in my mind, this is a prophetic profile of the timeline of the rapture or catching away of the church, and they lived it out in reality in a vision form, like John the Revelator did when he was caught up into heaven in, in his vision. Now he's talking to Elijah and Moses. Now somebody said, well, well why is it Elijah and Moses? Uh, some say that, well, Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses, but uh, that Moses doesn't qualify for one of the two witnesses because the two witnesses that prophesy the last three and a half years of tribulation period, they die in the streets of Jerusalem the last three, three days before the end of the tribulation. Now, Moses, if he's been resurrected, he is immortal. He cannot die again, cause, so he cannot die in the streets of Jerusalem. So you can X Moses out of that. Um, but I, personally, I, I believe it's uh, Enoch and Elijah because they have, neither one of them have died. Elijah evidently is still in heaven in, in his uh, natural body, and probably eating of the tree of life. But anyway, uh, here we find that it says, while they yet spake, Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Behold, a voice came out of the cloud, said, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Now notice, the cloud overshadowed them, and the voice came out of the cloud. Now here's an interesting thought, that uh, when Peter uh, tells about this later, in I think it was 1 Peter, he says, This voice we heard came from heaven. Well, they must have been in heaven then because it came out of the cloud and the cloud overshadowed them. So they must have been in heaven and the cloud was in heaven and it overshadowed them and the voice came out of heaven. So that seems to be more uh, in line with what it says here, that they were caught up into the new Jerusalem probably. And uh, then uh, you know that Jesus said, tell this vision to no man till the Son of Man be raised from the dead. Well, this is quite a startling event that happens in the New Testament. Now, remember the Solomon concept, Ecclesiastes 1, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. thing that is done, it is that which shall be done. And here's Jesus laying it out so plain that, that no one could miss it, at least when the revelation comes forth. We missed it for years. 
but when the generation comes on the scene that's going to be caught up, the revelation flows freely. So here it is. It's laid out. He waited six days. Now Luke says after about eight days, but you notice the word about. He didn't count them. <laughs> it was six days. Uh, Mark, I believe it's Mark and Matthew said it was six days. So Jesus waited six days. Why? Because it is a prophetic profile through the Solomon concept revealing this event that, that happened here reveals the rapture of the church. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that, that's exciting to me to know that God is able to reveal these things the way he does. Now, before I leave the broadcast, our book offer, again, this week is book offer number 2522. It's called End Time Events, Journey to the End of the Age. It's a 269-page paperback, and it's also the revised edition. We've, we've put some things in there about uh, that didn't get in the hardback book. It's $15 plus $4 postage and handling, and we have a toll-free order line. It's 1-877-396-9400. And uh, you can also order by, w, uh, by internet, www.charlescaps.com, and uh, you can do your order on the internet. That 800 number again is 1-877-396-9400. Now, in this book, we have these uh, prophetic profiles laid out in here, and also this skip sequence on this event that happened in Exodus 19. It's all in here. You can see it in the original Hebrew and how it's laid out, and it'll give you uh, the insight. And uh, also, here's, here's a page that it, it gives you some skip sequence that we found in 2 Kings. And uh, it's interesting how these things show up in the Scriptures. There's no doubt about it. God is revealing to this generation what other generations didn't know. But this book will take you on a scriptural journey, revealing the sequence and timing of end time events in a way that uh, most people never thought of, and I know I didn't until the Lord revealed it to me. Uh, it's through the Solomon concept. Until next time, this is Charles Capps reminding you that the enemy is defeated, God is exalted, and Jesus is coming soon. To order a copy of today's show or any product offered on this program, call 1-877-396-9400 or visit our website at caps.tv where you can order downloads of our MP3 teachings, eBooks, and watch other programs on demand. This broadcast has been sponsored by Caps Ministries and is dedicated to helping you put the Word of God to work in the everyday circumstances of your life.